डिटेंशन है is anniversary yesterday uh, it's been like 8 years now he is in illegal detention uh, from the authorities and no one is taking any action about it and no one is uh, bothered about the human rights over here over there in bahrain so we will talk about it in further detail and we have a wonderful guest with us to talk about the uh, uh, topic and uh, we will move on to our guest uh, we have uh, sister sundar asad from lebanon she is journalist and uh, brother uh, zafar uh, bangesh from uh, uh, canada he is uh, with us and we'll move on to our guest uh, assalam alaikum brother uh, zafar i'm really grateful for your time and it's really honored to have you and sister sundas thank you so much for joining us today on this important topic uh, first of all i would like to uh, ask Uh, why uh, ask something? Uh, first of all, sisters in this, I would uh, move on to you because you are also uh, looking at this topic very deeply and very much connected to this, uh, uh, you know, uh, issue as well. So I would like to ask, what is uh, reason behind Sheikh Ali detention? And it's been eight years since he is in illegal detention, and why there are no actions has been taken for uh, his uh, like. Uh, Okay, coming out of the jail and all that. So, how do you see that, and uh, what's the problem behind it? Okay, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First, uh, I express my condolences on the martyrdom of Sayyid Sahir alayhi salam. Uh, second, on this uh, occasion of uh, the the 80th uh, anniversary of the arbitrary. Detention of Sheikh Ali Salman. I express my solidarity with this great leader and with the oppressed Bahraini people. Actually, Sheikh Ali Salman has been imprisoned mainly because he has uh, called uh, the rights of his people. Sheikh Ali Salman uh, is well known for his peaceful action. He is uh, a moderate uh, leader. He is well known and appreciated by various uh, nations around the globe. He hasn't uh, incited hatred against anybody, even although you know that the Bahraini the brutality of the Bahraini regime. But Sheikh Ali Salman has been uh, focusing and trying hard to uh, call call and urge the Bahraini government to respect the rights of the people. and not to consider them as second class citizens and the bahrainis as you know are uh, marginalized and not equal uh, uh, equal rights they are denied a uh, job they are denied the very basic rights so uh, in 2011 as everyone knows uh, the bahrainis kicked off to the streets they called for these rights they called for reforms but unfortunately the government suppressed them the government murdered them uh, with the help of the saudi army with the help of uh, the gcc uh, troops they were uh, uh, they were imprisoned they were tortured they were exiled uh, you know there are a lot of violations that have been committed since 2011 so sheikh ali salman at that critical time incite uh, hatred and incite uh, a sectarian strife sheikh ali salman was insisting that uh, that this would uh, would uh, drive bahrain to various critical and dangerous uh, crises he tried hard to call the government to uh, to take uh, 
further measures, uh, actual and effective measures toward reforms, toward giving the people their rights. But unfortunately, the government ignored him, ignored his calls, despite being very peaceful calls. And and if you take uh, take a look on Sheikh Ali Salman's speeches, you will see that he all the time warned the people not to be driven to violence, not to be driven to the uh, sectarian rhetoric. In all of, it, of his speech, he addressed the Sunnis before the Shias. He called them, you are our brothers. We love you. We care about your interests. We care about your future generation, generations. Our movement is not, it's not a movement for the Shias. It's the, a movement for all the Bahraini citizens. But unfortunately, the government denied this cause. So uh, at that time, the uh, the GCC and the American and the US uh, embassy in Bahrain uh, have been were trying to make a mediation in order to uh, to settle the crisis. And uh, at that time, the Qatari. Uh, the Qatari, uh, then the, Qat uh, the Qatari Prime Minister called Sheikh Ali Salman in order to uh, to make to make a settlement or to resolve the the crisis that is uh, hitting Bahrain at that time. Uh, and this call were was very uh, it was open and everyone known about it and was announced in news and in public. Uh, after seven years, when the Bahraini regime uh, uh, when the Bahraini regime boycotted the uh, the Qatari regime, uh, at that time the re the regime remembered that call and used it against Sheikh Ali Salman in order to accuse him of uh, trying uh, of of collab collaborating with the Qatari regime in order uh, to clamp down against the Bahraini regime, which is uh, which is very ridiculous and very something no one can 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 trust or no one can uh, can use it as as uh, as an evidence against Sheikh Ali Salman but uh, but unfortunately this is the Bahraini regime a regime that has no ethics a regime that uh, that that at that at at the main time uh, is uh, is uh, making dialogue and uh, norm has normalized that actually with openly with the Zionist enemy but failed to uh, to dialogue and to to listen to this wise man, this man who care about the interests of all Bahrainis. Sheikh Ali Salman is behind bars because he has peacefully and honestly called for reforms, called for the rights of his people. He uh, rejects uh, any calls for armed uh, struggle he is a very peaceful man and this is not my it's not my assessment you can look at uh, look at the various international reports uh, that uh, have been issued since since 11, uh, since 2011 which insist that Sheikh Ali Salman is a political prisoner and Sheikh, Sheikh Ali Salman is in prison because of his political opinion Sheikh Ali Salman uh, has been uh, has been uh, was was once uh, and uh, was was once a representative in the Bahraini Parliament and has been trying hard uh, to uh, to reform his country to reform the 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 affairs of Bahrain to save the sovereignty of Bahrain to make Bahrain an independent state not like what Bahrain today has become a Zionist settlement unfortunately Bahrain today. Uh, is turning into into uh, uh, a hub of uh, terrorizing the people of West Asia and to uh, to threatening their uh, safety and their peace. So the main reason of Sheikh Ali Salman being in prison, the main reason of incarcerating Sheikh Ali Salman, is that because Sheikh Ali Salman has peacefully and sincerely called for an elected government called for an effective parliament and called for the rights of all the Bahraini people. That's mm. why Sheikh Ali Salman is arbitrarily uh, detained in the Bahraini notorious prisons. 
Uh, I will get back to you, Sister uh, uh, Sundas, and I'll move on to uh, Brother Safar. How do you see the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Brother, uh, you know, Sheikh Ali Salman uh, imprisonment, and uh, how we can help him to, like, he should be released, and it's been eight years for an injustice detention he is in. So, how do you see the word hypocrisy and the word, uh, you know, human rights organizations hypocrisy, and uh, how uh, how the word is, you know, uh, Berini, uh, Berin is, uh, you know, becoming a Zionist colonial uh, place, you know, you can say. So, what are your thoughts on that, and how we can help uh, our people in these? issues which are related to purely human rights and which are purely related to uh, injustice uh, around the globe and the people are suffering because of that. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this program. Uh, with respect yeah. to the imprisonment of uh, Sheikh Ali Salman for more than eight years now, uh, it is obvious that uh, the regime in Bahrain, which uh, does not represent the interests of the Bahraini people at all. Uh, it is, uh, as our sister pointed out, become uh, a Zionist colony. Uh, it had been for decades an American colony. Uh, America maintains its uh, naval base. The fifth fleet is based in Bahrain. And uh, I think we need to be clear in our minds that uh, neither the United States nor its allies, uh, whether uh, in the West or in the region, uh, are going to do anything about the rights of the Bahraini people because this regime that is in power in Bahrain uh, is serving the interests of the American imperialists and uh, the illegitimate entity in occupied Palestine the Zionist entity. So that's one aspect of it. The other, of course, is the issue of the silence or the virtual silence of human rights organizations um, uh, in the world. Now, it has uh, been our experience and we have observed that these human rights organizations uh, only take action or take notice when uh, if, let's say, a particular government is in power that the West does not like, then these human rights organizations come into action. And uh, if uh, the people that are struggling for their rights as they are in Bahrain, their basic fundamental right uh, to be able to vote for a government of their choice, uh, then uh, these, uh, this kind of struggle is ignored because the regime in Bahrain is serving the interests of uh, the imperialists and the Zionists. Now, with respect to the third question as to what we can do, uh, obviously it is uh, incumbent upon us, those of us that care about human rights, those of us that uh, want human dignity and want people's rights to be respected and that governments should represent the wishes of their people, then it becomes incumbent upon us that we raise our voices and uh, draw the attention of people in the societies where we are living. Now, I know that there are millions and millions of Muslims that live in Western societies, whether it's in North America or Europe or Britain, uh, France, Germany, etc. It then becomes incumbent upon us that we uh, begin to not only begin, but that we must consistently raise our voices for uh, the Bahraini people, uh, for their leaders that are incarcerated, like Sheikh Ali Salman. Uh, at the same time, as we consistently raise our voices for the oppressed people of Palestine, or we raise our voices for the oppressed people of Kashmir and other places, I think it is very important that we don't forget our brothers and sisters' struggle in Bahrain 
for their fundamental rights. So we can make a difference by becoming proactive, by aligning with other fair-minded people in the societies where we live. For instance, I live in Canada. There are many Canadians who are not Muslims, but they still care for human rights and human dignity. And we have been able to link up with them to uh, raise uh, our voices for uh, the oppressed people of Bahrain. And uh, I think one final point, at least as far as Muslims are concerned, that uh, they can uh, create awareness in their uh, mosques and Husseiniyas by raising the issue of the suffering of the Bahraini people and uh, linking it with the struggle uh, of uh, our, our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Ahlul Bayt, how they struggled for uh, their uh, rights and the methods that they use, that we can also adopt these methods in order to create a greater awareness. Uh, Sister Sundas, moving on to you, I would like to ask you, how is uh, Sheikh Ali Salman at the moment? What are uh, like what is his condition obviously when they are in such uh, you know imprisonments which are illegal and detentions so then people are suffering in different ways so and how about this family and what kind of demands they have obviously one is the unconditional release but obviously uh, what else do you think is supposed to be known by the people who are listening to you uh, regarding Sheikh Ali Salman, Bahraini people, their rights, and uh, uh, what are the difficulties and hindrances in between uh, this uh, release and uh, these rights? Okay. Well, you see, uh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's all right if you want to answer, uh, you can answer as well. Uh, but uh, 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 sister, I come back to you on the same question, but I'll take the view of uh, Brother Zafar as well. So, what do you uh, you can share your views on that as well? Okay, no worries. You, you, go ahead. Sorry, sister, go ahead, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, yes, uh, before answering your question, sister, I want to, to thank uh, the brother for highlighting this great issue, which is, as, as we know, we are commemorating the martyrdom of Sayyid al-Zahra. We remember something which is so uh, so uh, significant and so important in the life of Sayyid al-Zahra, which is, uh, you know, at that critical time, Sayyid al-Zahra uh, was in, uh, when everyone were against them in that society. Now, the Shia around the globe, I believe that they have uh, they have full. Uh, they have many uh, m many uh, things to do in order to uh, to to do something for the oppressed people, for our oppressed nations. It's our duty, as he mentioned, that in Canada, in the U.S., in Europe, uh, we in Lebanon, uh, as as we can. You know, the Bahrainis are are suffering. The Yemenis are suffering. The Shias in Qatif are suffering. Uh, our brothers in Syria are still suffering. We know, I have mentioned uh, previously, uh, that uh, the, the sanctions that are enforced against us in Lebanon, uh, many people are, are oppressed, especially here in West Asia. It's our responsibility, it's our duty, it's our obligation to raise their voice, to be their voice, okay? It's it's the lesson that we learn from Sayyid al-Zahra. It's Jihad al-Tabin, as Sayyid al-Qa'ad Ali al-Khamenei has uh, has labeled it it's it's our our duty to clarify and to be it and to raise their message to raise their uh, their suffering to to tell the glo to tell the people people around, as a, as a, as brother mentioned that not all the westerns are uh, are with their regimes and with their administrations they uh, they 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 still are good people who who st who can uh, stand in solidarity with us so, uh, uh, regarding your question, as you know, the Bahraini prisoners are notorious, and they they uh, they lack basic uh, basic necessities. We have learned we have learned a lot and listened a lot of this. Sheikh Ali Salman uh, has been in prison for eight years now. Uh, you know, during Corona. Uh, for two years uh, during the COVID-19 infection, uh, 
he uh, he along along with the other uh, prisoners of conscience uh, weren't able to see their families. Uh, also, there is a point that the the prison administration uh, insists on uh, putting a kind of uh, glass uh, uh, barrier between them and their families. Can you imagine, sister, that that they can't touch their children, they can't hug their moms, they can they can't uh, connect with them physically. So that's that is that, that it's quite heartbreaking. Sheikh Ali Salman. Uh, hasn't met his family for eight years now. Okay, uh, he has become a grandfather. His uh, his uh, elder son has got married, and he has he has become an, a grandfather uh, in, while in prison. Uh, his uh, his younger daughter was only for uh, forty days when he was imprisoned. She hasn't met her father for those uh, entire. Uh, Eight years. Uh, uh, last basic human right that people, even if they are in detention or in prison, they can yes. still meet their loved ones. So this regime, this regime that that claim that that uh, it respects human rights denies those political prisoners their basic rights, which is uh, against the basic humanitarian international laws. Uh, which are known by Nelson Mandela uh, rules, they uh, they violate these rules and violate the the rights of these prisoners, uh, these prisoner, uh, those prisoners, uh, prisoners of conscience. Uh, yesterday, uh, it was uh, it has been circulated uh, on social media a video of Sheikh Ali Salman. This video. Uh, it's actually a heartbreaking video. In his video, uh, in this video, the mother of Sheikh Ali Salman, I believe she is in her 80s. Uh, she was. Uh, you can you, you can't imagine that despite the may, the pain and despite uh, the absence of her uh, son, she was expressing pride in his son. She called him, "You are my hero. You are a crown on my head." I I I am proud of you and you, of your sacrifices. Everyone uh, needs you. This uh, the, uh, can you imagine that uh, that uh, how this uh, the, the 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 steadfast the steadfastness of this mother, and that's and that's is really why we have great great leaders because it's the mother the mother and I was mentioning previously the example of Sayyid Zahra Sayyid Zahra teach us. Uh, how to resist and also teach us as women how to prepare uh, great leaders and how to educate our children to uh, to hold the banner of calling for rights and of uh, of uh, facing the oppressed just like Sayyid al-Zahra has taught, uh, has prepared Imam al-Hassan, the example of Imam al-Hassan, and the example of Imam al-Hassan, the example of Sayyid al-Zainab, the mother of Shaykh Ali Salman is just like Sayyid al-Zahra. She has followed her example. It's and, and this is our duty as mothers, is to follow this example. It's our duty to prepare children who care about human everywhere around the globe, not only Shia, we don't call for the to stand in solidarity with with every oppressed around the globe. It's our duty to uh, to to be their voice, to raise their uh, their principles, to be just like them. That's true, uh, brother Azafar. If you want to add something more about it, and uh, can you shed some light on the uh, you know West Asia, for instance, why the most of the people who are in suffering, like politically culturally or in war and stuff like that if you see it's like it's in iraq in shah in syria in, Lebanon, in these kind of places which where which are like uh, which have the population of muslims mostly so how do you think why is that happening and why we can't uh, 
uh, get that justice. I mean, even though it's been 70 years, even for like uh, Kashmir, for instance, we are raising voice and all that. And we are talking about Palestine uh, from past uh, above maybe 70 years. So, and now obviously from a past many years is in Bahrain, which is whatever is happening. So what do you think? Why we can't uh, reach to that level? What? Uh, why these places can't get justice? Why people are in suffering more in places? What is the core reason behind? Uh, understanding of the global situation and how uh, various countries uh, around the world operate. Uh, I know that uh, many countries, particularly in the West, uh, the, the governments and regimes, etc., uh, talk about human rights, but they don't practice human rights. Uh, when you, for instance, look at the example of the United States, uh, which is the greatest perpetrator of violence against people worldwide, we see that uh, America is involved in wars in different parts of the world. Um, and there are many reasons for that. Number one, uh, that there are, for instance, uh, governments that refuse to submit to American demands or to become American colonies. Number two, there are countries that have certain uh, natural resources that the United States and the West wants, and so they target those countries as well. And then we have the situation whereby America is involved uh, in uh, competition with countries like China and Russia, and so any countries that uh, have friendly relations with, let's say, China and Russia are targeted. So we need to be very clear in our minds that while these Western governments predominantly, um, obviously because they are the ones that are uh, most influential in the world today, uh, that they may talk about human rights, but they don't practice them. Their uh, concern for human rights is selective. So for instance, even when the Zionists are killing the Palestinian people, uh, we hear very little uh, of any concern be, being expressed from these Western regimes. Uh, in fact, uh, on the contrary, uh, what we uh, constantly hear whenever the, the Zionists attack the Palestinian people, that almost every Western government immediately comes out with this ridiculous uh, excuse that to say, well, the Israelis have a right to defend themselves. I mean, this is so incredible that the Palestinians are getting killed, and yet they keep on claiming that Israel has the right to defend itself, as if the Palestinians do not have a right to defend themselves. Look at the situation in Yemen. Uh, the poor Yemenis have suffered for more than uh, now almost seven years now. Uh, the, the Saudis have launched a brutal campaign against them. They are murdering uh, Yemeni people. They have been besieged. Children have been killed. Uh, there is a cholera epidemic. Even the United Nations um, uh, itself, the, human, the United Nations Human Rights Council, and others have said that more than a million Yemeni children have been affected by cholera. They have also said that almost 90% of the Yemeni population is food deficient. And yet there is absolutely no or little action taken against the Saudis. Instead, the Saudis are being armed to the teeth by the Americans, the British, the French, and other Western regimes, even though they know that the Saudi regime is a terrible regime. And if you look at the situation in Bahrain, obviously Bahrain is a smaller entity, it's only about a million people, and yet since the regime is totally aligned with uh, the, the Americans and the Zionists, uh, therefore uh, the suffering of the Bahraini people uh, are completely uh, ignored. Uh, and of course, you know, as our sister mentioned, the prisons in Bahrain are terrible. They are, uh, you know, they, they, the prisoners are uh, badly tortured over there. They are humiliated. They are uh, persecuted for no crime except to say that, you know, they should have their basic rights. This is a fundamental right that is even uh, enshrined in the United Nations Charter. But again, I'd like to point out that the United Nations Charter and any of these other 
uh, international treaties and laws, etc., are only there on paper. Uh, they are not applied uh, in terms of uh, the suffering of the people. They are only brought out or trotted out when, if there is, let's say, a government that goes against the wishes of uh, the, the imperialist West and the Zionists, then uh, a lot of pressure is exerted on them. As we see, for instance, in Syria or, uh, you know, in the Islamic Republic of Iran, which uh, insists on remaining independent of these uh, imperialist powers. And it has suffered tremendously as a, as a consequence of sanctions and all kinds of other propaganda of sabotage, of assassinations, of, uh, you know, all kinds of other uh, cruel activities that have been uh, inflicted upon the Islamic Republic of Iran because it insists on remaining independent. But I don't want to sound pessimistic. What I want to say is that I think the global situation is changing and it's towards the oppressed people's rights uh, because there are now uh, other powers, other power centers that are emerging, uh, including Russia and China, in which I believe that the Islamic Republic of Iran does play a significant role because it has become the epicenter of resistance. So there is a resistance movement that has emerged in the region, uh, in, in the broader Middle East, uh, which is beginning to change the dynamics. And I'm quite hopeful that, inshallah, in the not too distant future, uh, we should be able to see uh, significant changes in the condition of the people uh, that are under oppression. And, and I hope and pray that uh, the people that are suffering, that they continue to not lose hope and continue to resist their occupiers uh, so that they can achieve their uh, goals and their legitimate rights. Here I do have one question uh, with you, Zafar Bhai, that do you think we are doing enough to reach out to other communities in order to uh, share our viewpoint of, for example, peace, justice, our own cultural values and stuff like that, so that they could, because obviously uh, if we see around the globe, the media is under control of these Zionist uh, people or the people who are like uh, related to imperialists so how do you think uh, we can change the viewpoint of the common people because they obviously see and watch just media and media is under control and uh, they show and they create uh, only those opinions which are obviously uh, helpful for them so how do you see that are we doing enough as community especially the people who are living in west and uh, they are reaching out to other communities and help uh, educating them as well like okay these are, these are these are the issues of on ground and these are real and genuine human rights problem and these are not being shown on the media obviously these are just on ground so are we doing enough in that regard uh, obviously, uh, a lot more needs to be done. Uh, <clears throat> I believe whatever we have done or we do uh, is not enough because um, the, the suffering of the people uh, worldwide, uh, of Muslims uh, in many parts of the world, are immense. Uh, and definitely, we need to uh, increase our efforts. And in this, uh, in this regard, what I would also like to say is that uh, I think we should not uh, put any faith in the Western media or the corporate media, as it is called, to represent our point of view. In fact, their aim is to distort everything about the legitimate rights and grievances of the oppressed people of the world. It's not just Muslims, incidentally. We need to keep in mind that, for instance, uh, people in Venezuela are suffering. Uh, people in Cuba are suffering. They are not Muslims, uh, they are Christians by and large, and yet they are subjected to these uh, crimes because those people or their governments stand up for the rights of their people against uh, the bullying of the imperialist powers. So what we can do is, number one, as I said earlier, that we reach out to uh, the common man in the street, whether it is in Canada, the United States, Europe, etc., reach out to them because there are many good people. This has been my experience living here in Canada. We interact with uh, mainstream Canadians and we have found that there are human rights organizations, there are uh, peace activists, 
there are anti-war activists, there are anti-poverty activists that are willing to work with us. They need to, that want to hear about our uh, situation so that they are better informed, that they can begin to uh, join hands with us. The second point that I think uh, is important, and I think this is something that, that your TV program is doing, that we as Muslims need to develop our own media outlets. Living in the West, now it has become uh, quite easy to be able to uh, run a TV program. All one needs is to have a little bit of, um, you know, uh, to be internet savvy and to be able to use the technology in order to project our point of view. And I think it is possible that uh, with this kind of information, that we put it out and we, uh, you know, get our point of view across to the people. I think this can have a positive in impact. So I think a lot more can be done. The question is of being aware, and this awareness can be created through media platforms that, for instance, you have or we run Crescent International News Magazine and uh, other kinds of activities. And I think these are the kinds of things that can uh, increase awareness. And that can then help to mobilize people uh, to support uh, justice, uh, fundamental human rights, and peace in the world. Mm. Uh, Sister Sundas, uh, how would you add your comment on that point? Uh, like, for example, uh, if we see, uh, you know, uh, media and all that, we do have some some kind of religious media, maybe a little bit, but not as such, uh, which is practically doing uh, dealing with the our news. For instance, news which are based on truth, justice, and human rights generally, and which are not uh, money-making people or something uh, uh, like imperialists or some kind of people like that. So, how do you see that? And anything more you would like to add regarding Sheikh Salman? Because we are moving towards the end of the show, and we need to uh, address our other part as well. So, if you can comment on that, and we can uh, then move on to the next part. Yes, I believe that, yes, we have to find an alternative media uh, to reach those people, to show them the atrocities that are being committed by their governments and how their the money they are paying uh, by taxes or uh, the money they are paying are manipulated to kill us in, the, in West Asia and to oppress us uh, illegally. So I believe, yes, that it's our duty to move on from the defensive mode uh, to the mode of, uh, of trying to be uh, in the center of these communities, to tell them, to show them, to show them evidence, to, to, to work, uh, to work uh, whatever, uh, in whatever uh, to the activities and to organize events, to show them how our people are being killed, how our, being, our people are being uh, tortured, are being, uh, are being driven into, uh, into, uh, uh, into uh, uh, they are being, st they are stri starving them to, uh, into, uh, starving them and uh, leading them into empowerment, uh, into, uh, into poverty and uh, being victims of their sanctions it's our duty uh, to find these outlets to to manipulate them in order to uh, let them know uh, about the grievances of our people and the plights of our people here in west asia the grievances of the bahrainis the grievance of people of leaders of honest leaders like sheikh ali salman of the grievance of the yemenis the grievance of the lebanese the palestinians uh, also, as brother has mentioned, the, the Cubans, uh, every person who is suffering around the globe, it's our duty to be their voice, to uh, to help them in uh, any possible means uh, that can really make a change. Well, that's, uh, that's really true. Uh, brother Jafar, I would move on to you and would like to ask that, uh, how do you see the FIFA World Cup? Like, obviously, there was so much uh, ongoing in that World Cup, and it was just not mere World Cup, it was kind of uh, first time in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, Islamic state, one of the Islamic states, it was happening, and it was very much controversial on different uh, reasons. 
uh, uh, and uh, we have seen uh, like uh, always uh, west is trying to teach muslims or Mus or you can say the other people like you this is for example right and this is illegal and this is legal and this is uh, human right and this is something why do they who are they to teach others like for instance that uh, this is something they think is right is right for the other communities as well because obviously it might not be so how do you see that controversy uh, uh, during, uh, and what kind of controversies you think are really important to understand and uh, reflect upon uh, which we have observed during the uh, world cup uh, 2022 Because it highlights um, the uh, cultural imperialism aspect of the West. Uh, basically, there is a notion, particularly uh, among Western governments and uh, their media, that somehow their norms and their values are universal values. Uh, let me give you specific examples. For instance, one of the objections that was raised uh, at the beginning was that uh, Qatar is not allowing uh, beer and alcohol inside the stadium. Now, I recall when I was a student in England back in the 70s, uh, I used to see on television uh, when these football matches used to take place between various teams, whether it was Manchester United or Chelsea or whatever, uh, their particular fans would not only drink inside the stadiums, but they would begin to fight against each other, throwing beer bottles at each other, smashing people's heads, and then they come out and they indulge in other vandalism and other kinds of uh, anti-social behavior. And obviously, Qatar is a predominantly, overwhelmingly Muslim country, rightly did not allow alcohol to be served inside the stadium. Although, regrettably, they had, you know, places outside where alcohol was served. Uh, although I would have thought that a Muslim country would not allow that, um, you know, because that is part of uh, what Islam teaches us. Yet, they allowed that. There was still objection that, uh, oh, it is not allowing, uh, you know, alcohol and beer inside the stadium. I want to point out, France is a non-Muslim country. Uh, it has all kinds of strange and idiotic values, and yet even France forbids the sale of alcohol and beer inside the stadiums because they see the kind of damage that uh, that these vandals would then cause uh, if they consume uh, these kinds of things. Inside. Number two, the other issue that was brought up was, and it was quite, important, and this is the, the so-called rights of LGBTQ, whatever you know as if to say these kinds of values are universal values and everybody else has to accept them. I think this is, these societies are actually committing suicide. They don't realize what they are doing. They are ruining their own lives and they are imposing these kinds of values on Muslims and other people. In fact, the overwhelming majority of the people in the world do not believe in adopting the kinds of lifestyle that uh, the, this, these Western countries are imposing on them. And in any case, these Western values are not uh, static. They are not consistent. They are moving and changing all the time. So for instance, you know, if you look at, um, I'll give you the example of Canada. Uh, until the year 2005, uh, marriage was defined as between a male and a female. And it was only under pressure from these groups that it was changed in 2005 that they said, marriages between any two consenting adults. This was in Canada. In other countries, similar sort of, you know, movements have taken place. Regrettably, they're now even imposing these things on young children in schools as young as five years old. They're telling them that it's okay to have a man, a, a man marry another man or a woman marry another woman. I mean, you know, this is incredible that, you know, they not only do they want to practice these things themselves, they want to impose it on other people. When we look at the statistics, only 5% of the world's population maybe perhaps believe in, you know, gay, lesbian rights or whatever. If these people want to commit, you know, genocide, uh, social genocide in their own societies, that's their choice. But we don't have to accept them. I mean, after all, what, are, what about our human rights? What about our values? 
If we don't want to accept their values, why should they be imposing them on us? And this was turned into a major issue in Qatar. They were constantly harping on this as if the World Cup was not about soccer, it was about LGBTQ rights. And so these are the kinds of idiotic things that these people do, these people indulge in, and then they want to impose them on other people. We should take, take a firm stand on this and say, our religion teaches us that there is a different lifestyle. It's perfectly fine. It is working. There are no problems in our societies, unlike these Western societies. So why should we have to adopt something that is going to create problems for us? If these people want to create problems for themselves, we would say don't, but that's their choice. Hmm. That's really, uh, you have uh, rightly pointed out uh, these things. Obviously, if they want to do the, uh, you know, suicide, it's their choice. Why they, who they are to impose on others, obviously. How do you see, uh, sister, this kind of controversy which has happened in the Qatar and when we see that Western people who always have a very, uh, you know, a media based uh, view of Muslim culture and all that or society and all that. But when they expose to a Muslim culture, they said uh, they have seen that people uh, who are Muslim, uh, you know, players who are uh, playing and winning or even losing, they are uh, thanking God and they are respecting their mothers and elders and fathers and hugging them and respecting them and they are very respectful their fam to their families instead of their obviously girlfriends or something. So how do you see uh, uh, this kind of uh, exposure uh, which Western people had in Qatar and what kind of uh, issues do you think is really important for us to understand from this work of uh, which was highly politicized, uh, you know, controversial in many ways uh, through these kind of LGBT slogans and stuff like that. They wanted to impose their cultural values and everyone was throwing some kind of their own, uh, uh, you know, connection to their values in uh, some way. So how do you see that and uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yes. Uh, I believe that the event itself, it's not, it was not the efforts of the Qatari regime, but of the people, the, uh, the Muslim and the Arab people there in, uh, in the World Cup have been playing a very great role in exposing the true and the genuine Islamic values. Here I mention, I must, we must mention something that in the recent years, the Islam that have been, uh, that was, been, uh, that has been exposed to the West was the Wahhabi Islam. The uh, the uh, distorted vision of Islam, which has nothing to do with Islam. At the World Cup, Muslim has been trying to show uh, many genuine, lofty values of Islam. First of them is uh, their uh, the respect to the value of the family, their respect for others. It's according to the ayah, to the Anic verses that. Uh, we, have, we have making you uh, different nations in order to, to, to get introduced uh, to each other. Those people have shown true tolerance, uh, the true Islam. Also, they have shown something which is quite important. And it's not the Qatari role, the, the, the official Qatari role in uh, in uh, showing their solidarity with Palestine and showing their rejection for normalization, the Qatari regime has allowed the Zionists to come to the Mon to the Mondial and to the World Cup. But the there, the Muslims and the Arabs, shown their rejection for normalization. They have shown their rejection for anything that is called uh, Zionist, anything that is related for this. Uh, occupation, this illegal regime that has been implemented in our region. It's quite important and it's quite significant to show that it was the role of the people. We don't, no one can't, can't, uh, ignore, can't uh, ignore or, uh, or forget the vision that Qatar has played uh, against Syria. They have devastated Syria. We have lost a lot of our beloved sons as martyrs in Syria because of the vicious Qatari role. So it was the people who have shown during the World Cup the true Islamic values, the Islamic of solidarity with others, the, 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 the values of respecting others, and the values of uh, hospitality to the Muslims. It's quite 
Uh, and that is related to the idea that we have been dissecting previously, that it's our duty, wherever we are, whatever, whatever capabilities we have, is to show the true Islam, the true Islam that cares about humanity, that care about true and genuine peace, which, which the Prophet and the Holy Prophet have taught us. That's so true. Uh, Brother Zafar, how do you see the uh, act of, uh, you know, there are so many people who were obviously uh, representing Iran in positive way and there was some, uh, like for example, if we, saw certain, if we look at the saucer team who didn't want to recite, for example, uh, you know, their own uh, national anthem uh, in solidarity with, for example, Western values or Western uh, propagate uh, propaganda whichever uh, way you take it so how do you see that hypocrisy of that team and uh, the people of that kind of mindset who are like uh, always are influenced by the western media their propagation and they don't even understand the real value of islamic uh, obviously uh, you know based on islamic uh, values uh, they don't understand that value and they uh, they just uh, want to like impress for us just uh, those western people and western uh, authorities and stuff like that so how do you see that hypocrisy and how do you see uh, the other people who were uh, in favor of their own values and they respected them enough and uh, they should uh, uh, you know strong respect to their own uh, values their action during the World Cup as well. Well, I think that uh, uh, what you mentioned, this particular episode uh, clearly uh, demonstrates how the Western media uh, depicts various events. So, for instance, uh, you know, we know that uh, in September there were some disturbances that were actually engineered disturbances. The riots that were instigated in the Islamic Republic of Iran were instigated from outside. And now there is ample proof. A number of people have been arrested. These are agents, uh, you know, the dual nationals of, of Britain and France and other countries that have been involved in instigating trouble inside the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, and uh, when what we witnessed in, in Qatar was that there were a lot more people in support of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Islamic system in Iran and a tiny minority that were mesmerized by the West. These are West toxicated people that worship the West, that hate Islamic values. These are people that have very little to do with Islam. They, they are just uh, full of hatred for Islam. And that's why they commit these horrible atrocities over there. And yet the Western media was constantly projecting these handful of people and ignoring the vast majority of the people of Iran uh, who were in Qatar in solidarity uh, with their own team and with their own government. And this also is a reflection of exactly uh, what has been going on in Iran. And when I was looking at the, you know, the depiction, for instance, on BBC or CNN or these other Western media outlets, uh, they would show these rioters from close up. So, I mean, this is a trick that, that is used in, in, in media projection that when the, the people are small in number, you show them from close up so they appear a, a large number of people. But in fact, these people, these rioters were going around burning government buildings, burning mosques, were blowing up people inside mosques. They were attacking ambulances and, and setting them on fire. They killed security personnel. They slaughtered them in the streets, slitting their throats in the street. It was all filmed. And, and yet the Western regimes are supporting these criminals uh, as if they were struggling for their rights. I mean, I want to ask which country, which government in the world would allow people to go around burning buildings, destroying banks, killing soldiers and police officers in the streets? Which government would allow that? And yet, Somehow they say, oh, these people are struggling for their rights. The rights does not mean you go and kill people. Rights means, okay, if you have certain legitimate grievances, you express them. And the people of Iran have perfect liberty, complete liberty to do so. But when there were literally millions of uh, our sisters that came out in hijab, in support of hijab, they were completely ignored. They were not really covered by the mainstream Western media. The alternative media, of course, provided certain coverage to that. 
but the mainstream media simply did not. And there are all kinds of other, you know, uh, idiotic allegations made against the Islamic Republic of Iran. But to come to the issue of the World Cup in Qatar and how it was presented, uh, you know, it was interesting that, you know, when, when they, uh, uh, the, the, the coach of Iran's team was constantly being uh, questioned about uh, the riots taking place in Iran, he got so exacerbated. And he said, you know, this was a BBC reporter. He told that, that woman, he said, would you please go and ask Southgate, that Southgate, of course, is the name of the coach for uh, in the English team. He said, could you please go and ask him what the British did in Afghanistan in murdering tens of thousands of people? Would you please do that for me? And of course, that BBC reporter was not going to do that. So you see, when these people go and kill millions of people around the world, in fact, you know, there have been studies done. There is an Australian professor, Gideon uh, Polia, who's, who's done a study who says that since uh, 2001, America and its allies have killed more than 32 million people worldwide, either through direct wars or through sanctions or through, uh, you know, prohibiting medicines from reaching the people or through all kinds of other means that they have killed 32 million people around the world. This is genocide of Muslims that have been that has taken place. And yet you wouldn't find this kind of information in the Western media. They just completely ignore it. They think that obviously the West has the right to go and kill people. Uh, and, and yet, you know, when you when you find that uh, in Iran, there were these rioters uh, killing people, innocent people, uh, you know, they, they were destroying property. Uh, the West was supporting them. And so what we saw in Qatar was specifically this Western agenda, Western imperialist agenda, imposing their uh, values and their information on others. Whereas, in fact, the people of Iran, to their credit, the vast majority stood in support of their football team, as well as of the system of governance in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Mm, uh, that's why we are he heading towards the end of the show. So, sister, I just have two, three minutes left. So, I just want your, uh, you know, uh, uh, viewpoint on the uh, point uh, Brother Duffer has mentioned. Do you think the uh, next World Cup, which will be in 2026, I guess, so uh, they will be having the, those slogans like war crimes against America and, uh, you know, the kind of uh, bands we need, they will, we will be able to see such like, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter or uh, you can say Me Too armbands uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, things in next World Cup or the genocide and uh, human rights, uh, you know, uh, all the human rights violations they have done uh, through their war crimes. Uh, we would be seeing such kind of slogans in uh, next World Cup. Do you think that? Unfortunately, one who follows history and knows the history of those colonialist powers knows that they they don't they don't uh, care about human rights. They don't care about our grievances. What we are uh, what we are concerned about is what we are concerned about, is about the arrival of our true savior, Imam Mahdi, the man and Jesus Christ, and that's our only hope. He's the only hope of every Muslim person. And at that time of, of awaiting this savior, it's our duty to make our best to prepare the ground for this Imam to appear and to save all the oppressed people around the globe. Thank you so much, Sister Sundar Sul. Uh, Asad. Uh, 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 it is the end of the show, and uh, Sister Sundar Sul Asad is uh, a journalist from Lebanon. She joined us today. Brother Zafar Bangesh has joined us from Canada. I'm really grateful for both of them. And uh, just to uh, like uh, to the viewers, I would say we should always seek justice, truth, and uh, uh, you know we should work towards that, and we should increase our knowledge, and we should in, uh, work for truth and justice with this message i'll take a leave and then we'll see you inshallah next week allah hafiz